Hello and welcome to the Disru Disruptive Innovation Festival 2017, where we ask the question, what if we could redesign everything? We might take it for granted, but the concept of a company is an extraordinary invention. Our guest today describes them as a marvel of human ingenuity. Many believe, though, that in the last few decades, the concept of the company has been hijacked, and what's good for business is no longer good for society. Coming up in this show today, we're going to dig into some of that, explore the role of the company in society, what's gone wrong, and what we should expect next from the 21st Century Corporation. We're in the last week of this three-week online festival. As you may know, the DIFF is an incredibly interactive platform, so please do, as audience members, submit your questions throughout the session. You can do so by submitting in the comment box below or by sending it to us by Twitter and using the hashtag ThinkDiff. My name is Ashima Sukhdev, and I'm one of the team here at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I'm delighted to be joined in the studio today by our guest, Simon Corkin, who is going to explore some of these issues with us. Simon is an award-winning business journalist who has written for The Observer, The Economist, and The Guardian. And fun fact, he edited what was claimed to be the first ebook as well. So Simon, welcome to The Diff. Thank you. Um, it's great to have you here. So you've called the company um, a marvel of human ingenuity, um, perhaps the most remarkable economic construct of all time. I thought we could just start by exploring some of that. What, why are companies important to our economy? And why is it important how they're managed as well? Well, <clears throat> we have to start with the fact that we, what we really live in is organizational uh, economies. It's on organizations that we uh, depend for our, for our breakfast, bread, and tea, not the individual humans that um, Adam Smith proposed. But the point is that the com companies are an amplifying device. So they amplify both the human and the material resource to do things that um, neither could do on their own. And the other thing about companies, which is often um, not taken into account, is that in theory, they could actually be immortal. I mean, there were companies in corporations, rather, in, in Roman times, but to this day, there's a company called Stora Enso, which is a Finnish company, which began as a Swedish copper mine, Stora, and was incorporated in about the year 1280. And um, in the UK, there are a number of companies, often banks and brewers, uh, and the two auctioneers uh, as well, Christie's and um, Sotheby's, which date back to the date back hundreds of years to, the, to at least the 18th century. So, uh, you know, longevity is is a feature. It's also and the fact that companies can last so long gives them they can kind of act as a as a vehicle for transferring wealth back and forth between generations so um, a responsible long-lived company invests for the future and can thus benefit the future generation but if it does it well and it has a good reputation, that is reflected back in a higher share price, which benefits those today. So it's a kind of economic time machine, which is like the nearest that. thing <laughs> to econom economic magic there is. That's a great, great way to start. So thank you for <coughs> offering that perspective on why companies are important. Um, Obviously, this, this concept and the idea of a corporation has been around for centuries. Um, can you tell us, sort of digging into the discussion now, on what's actually gone wrong in the last few decades? Or why has this idea of, a, uh, of or why has this concept of economic mag magic in companies almost disappeared? What's, what's, what's wrong with yes, this story? Yes, today? yes, yes. Well, in my view, and I, I'm very far from being alone on this, um, the company has been hijacked. 
and um, it's been hijacked to the extent that its interests and those the interests of the company and the at least in the um, Anglo-Saxon economies we should uh, say that but in the Anglosphere at least uh, the interests of the corporation and the interests of society have diverged and this is really because of the um, the rise and rise since the 1970s of the idea of um, the primacy of shareholders, shareholder value. Um, in a famous article in 1970, the, um, the Chicago economist Milton Friedman uh, wrote a piece entitled The Social Responsibility of Businesses to Increase Its Profits. And the kind of advantage of that, that it was very clear and straightforward, it made seem to make the job of managing less complicated. And it was taken up <clears throat> with enthusiasm by uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. <clears throat> and building on the work of other Chicago economists, it became a fully fledged and developed uh, theory, academic theory, and, um, and it has been unchallenged since uh, then until this day. And what it broadly means, has meant, is that instead of as in the years following the Second World War, companies reinvesting their profits in productive uh, plant, factory, in R&D to create new products and new markets, um, what you might call a retain and reinvest um, capital allocation policy, they started paying almost all of it uh, back to shareholders in the form of uh, dividends and increasingly and most more toxically in share buybacks to the point where now uh, many companies are actually almost routinely uh, distributing more to shareholders in those two forms. Uh, than the total of their profits. And the implication of that, of course, is that there's no money for uh, reinvestment, there's no money for uh, innovation, which is one reason why innovation has tailed off over the last three decades. Uh, companies don't create jobs anymore, they prefer not to, they prefer to invest in efficiency uh, and that often means automation um, and simply recycle uh, the proceeds back to back to shareholders yeah absolutely. so so that so and I mean the the point I suppose that I'm one of the points I'm trying to make is that um, what companies do what how companies are run and for what purpose mm. has macroeconomic effects. And the, the trends that are uh, summed up by economists are the product of what happens in companies. Absolutely. So just to summarize, I mean, you hit on a, a lot of fantastic points there. So it's this idea of um, companies basically only going for profit at this point. Um, the idea that they're not necessarily reinvesting um, into their, their economies and communities. Um, they're driven by shareholder value, which may be a myth. And finally, that um, they're not no longer necessarily creating jobs as well. Absolutely, um, absolutely. It's just, yeah. a, it, mm -hmm. it is ironic, as you say, that um, the whole idea is founded on a myth. Mm. And the, the, the founding myth is that shareholders own companies. 
and and they don't. Although you have this uh, repeated almost every every day of the week on the radio and television and in the in the press, the assumption is that shareholders own companies and they don't. It's absolutely clear legally in every jurisdiction in the states over here, shareholders own shares and that gives them cert certain rights but they don't own the company and uh, directors and managers are not employed by shareholders, they're employed by the company and the fiduciary, fiduciary duty of directors is to the company, not to shareholders. Oh. And, and that's, it's kind of, um, it seems to be a dislodgeable myth. But the whole of management, the whole way companies are managed uh, follows from that. that myth, yeah, absolutely. I also wanted to touch um, a bit more on the jobs discussion. Mm. So you said companies are now after efficiency, which doesn't mean jobs. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? What, one of the themes of this festival is the age of automation, which is obviously playing a mm. role here. Um, tell us more about what you see happening to jobs um, within companies and also what the ideal should be. Well. It, uh, I must say, it, I mean, it really upsets me. It drives me crazy the way um, technology and indeed globalization are often talked about as kind of forces, ineluctable forces of nature um, uh, that, that take some inevitable course. It's inevitable that jobs are going to go. It's inevitable uh, that globalization takes uh, the form that it does. No, absolutely no. Um, you know, technology isn't destiny. It takes the form that it does because of investment decisions taken in company boardrooms and, uh, and the R&D that they do and they don't do in their labs. And the same is true of globalization. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't let them get away with that. Technology could be used to augment human capability, not to supplant it. And um, it's uh, uh, a myth that it, it is taking the form that, that it does out of some unchangeable um, some unchangeable force we can and th we should do it differently. Mm. So you, I mean this is kind of the second myth that we don't have any control over Absolutely. what technology is doing Absolutely. to us, we're yes, not just yes. victims of yeah. this. Yeah. Yes, quite, Absolutely. we shouldn't be victims of it, mm -hmm. that's a good way of putting it. Um, I also just, while we're sort of covering what's wrong with companies today, would you say that it's uh, these kind of five main points that you laid out, would you say that applies to all companies, large and small? Is it more focused with public international organizations? Yeah, or? good. Good. It is largely the public, uh, publicly listed companies because they're subject to, you know, very, very strong pressures from the capital markets, from Wall Street and the city. And, and again, it is particularly uh, strong in uh, the Anglo-American, uh, Anglo uh, also Australian uh, economies. But, um, and there's some striking research mm -hmm. which shows that private companies, at least in the States, invest at twice the rate of, uh, uh, of public companies. And there is a sort of th thought that sees the publicly listed company actually as, as a doomed species because it's not investing enough in its own future to, to survive. And that explains why um, as um, Jerry Davis talked about in his, um, his session here at DIFF, which I urge people to look at if they're interested in this area, um, there are 50% fewer US and UK listed companies than there were 10 years ago. And um, you know the, the remainder have either um, been taken over or 
um, or have gone, gone bust or, um, or simply haven't been replaced by oh. new companies wanting to go public uh, coming through because entrepreneurs can see that it's, it's the, the conditions uh, laid down by Wall Street and the city are not con conducive to long and prosperous life. Absolutely. I was about to mention that this this topic of companies dying and not being replaced has come up many times in the diff, mm. um, but you did that for me. <laughs> uh, has it? No, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to just move on. I mean, it, we've discussed the, the problems of, of corporations and companies right now. It seems like there are more and more forums where the the failures of the 20th century corporation are being discussed. Um, the people seem cognizant of it. Um, one of these forums is the Peter Drucker Forum, um, which was actually held last week in Vienna, and which I believe you were, were attending as well. Um, just as a bit of background for the audience, Peter Drucker is considered sort of the one of the godfathers of the management field. Um, and this forum is held every year to bringing together businesses and corporates and so on um, to talk about the latest state of management. Could you, uh, given your experiences there last week, could you maybe share a few highlights on what the the key points of discussion were or things that particularly hit you? Yes, this? yes, yes. Very, it's very interesting, actually, because against a uh, background where, you know, you have to say that actually some things like the you know the hold hold of shareholder value and so on are not particularly getting better and witness the sense of exclusion <clears throat> that we've seen both in the states and in the uk reflected in trump and brexit and so on so things aren't necessarily obviously getting better but there were two brilliant moments at uh, the drucker forum in Vienna, both of which posited, and I, not stupidly, I don't think, uh, but but hope. And one was um, the, uh, the an address by uh, Carlotta Perez, who's um, an economic historian and theoretician of development, and she's shown that. Um, technological revolutions like the one we're experiencing now uh, historically have followed a pattern and the pattern is a, a kind of bubble at the start then the bubble blows up and there's a bit of a recession or depression and if the right conditions are united at the end of that uh, depression, there can then be a period of sustained growth and mm -hmm. prosperity. And sh as she sees it, that we're exactly at the midpoint here. We've had uh, the, the, the whole <clears throat> the IT, computer, internet, mobile, mobile revolution. We had the bubble. Uh, we then had uh, the second massive blow up of the system. You know, the wholly man-made management created a uh, great crash in 2008. And now we're, we're, we're on a cusp and the, the, the technology is all there for, for the next era of prosperity. But what we lack uh, the uh, the supporting social institutions and a kind of synergistic view of where that technology should be directed like i mean it could be there's an obvious candidate so green growth mm -hmm. for example the whole thing but the circular economy the or the donut economy, uh, or all the things that you've been talking about in the festival, and it's it, it. And if that could be unleashed, you know, we could be on the brink of a new. And she uses the term "new golden age," mm. um, but it's been held back by um, the. Again, we come back to this: the the, the companies viewing their their job is simply to make money for shareholders and governments totally enthrall 
uh, to this and uh, paralysed and unable to act in any sort of directing sense. So that was the first one. And the second one was actually the concluding address by uh, the great, um, by Charles Handy, who is the UK's own uh, wonderful, uh, thoughtful, humanist uh, sort of management guru. And he started by saying that, uh, you know, 500 years, years ago, Luther had, uh, an unknown friar had pinned his thesis on a door in an unknown place called Wittenberg and begun the revolution, which then led on to the Enlightenment, blah, blah, blah. And indeed, the foundation of the corporation as a product of the Enlightenment. And um, it was time to bang our own 99, 95 theses mm -hmm. on the door and start again. And we don't look to big leaders to do it. Do it, do it yourself. And the time is now. And uh, you know, if not now, when? If not, if not us, who? Absolutely, absolutely That's brilliant. Fantastic. And he had a standing ovation. And <laughs> it's great to hear that much energy in the in the room as yeah, well. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, it was really good. On that point of burning fires and um, the golden, the possible golden age. Um, I'm just going to pause the conversation for now, and um, we'll pick up on more of that after this. Sure. Um, but I'd like to just ask my co-host, Ross, uh, to tell us what else is coming up at the DIF. Uh, a lot of themes that tie into some of our discussions so far as well. Thanks, Ash. Uh, Simon and Ash have covered some fascinating issues faced by businesses in the 21st century. If you want to explore the modern economy even further, I definitely recommend you check out the interview we did earlier this week with uh, Kate Rayworth, uh, author of Donut Economics. Um, and uh, she describes herself as a rogue economist. She's got some fascinating insights into the problems that we cause when we try and understand modern economies using uh, old school mindsets and uh, out of date um, thinking. She's also the only economist I've ever seen use a hose pipe to demonstrate why closed loop systems will not be enough to generate uh, effective circular economies. Um, there's also a lot of talk right now about basic incomes and whether or not they can provide the solutions we'll need as we progress through 21st century uh, economy and the, the sort of dawn of AI. Um, that's something we're going to delve into tonight. At five o'clock we've got a session, how the circular economy will finance basic income. That's with Leonard Hulsboss. Uh, and then when you're wondering what to spend all your basic income cash on, uh, I would say check out the session on Thursday at four o'clock with uh, Tom Cummings and Bjorn Backer. That's Stop Buying, Start Living the Subscribed Life. That's going to be uh, looking at the way we consume products and services uh, in the 21st century. Uh, but now it's uh, time to head back to Ash and Simon. Thank you for that, Ross. Lots of great sessions lined up there um, and previous ones to catch up on as well. So Simon, back to the discussion at hand. Um, I wanted to now, now that we've sort of covered what the role of the company is, what's wrong with it today, I um, wanted to look forward a little bit more and we've already started to touch on some of these themes. Um, what, what is the alternative that we should be looking for? I'd, lo I'd, lo I'd love your perspective on um, what some of the solutions are here, and maybe a few examples that you can offer as to companies that are doing it well today. Okay, well, th there, there is a view that, um, you know, the market will, ironically, will take, uh, will, will deal with part of the problem. I mean, if it's true that, um, that the public listed company, at least in the States and the UK, is not fit to survive in the current ecology because of all the things we mentioned, then they'll go out of existence and private companies um, uh, invest more and so on. So, so um, the problem with that, well, there are two problems with that. One is that um, private companies take uh, time to, to, to get established. There's a huge destruction of value if, as the older companies go out of 
existence and um, and also the remaining big companies, the, the big in, internet companies, which are the biggest companies in the world now, uh, are, are simply too big to regulate, uh, too big to control, and they're still um, sucking so much value out rather than uh, rather than putting it in. So there's, so, okay, well, let's part that for a minute. Um, but you do see, um, you do see the phenomenon of now, and Jerry Davis, I know, has talked about that, pop up mm. companies because you can assemble a company these days uh, like, a, like a Lego model. Um, you, you can um, put together the parts and almost create an instant company and disassemble it again when the particular task is over so so there are new models um, there are new models there and uh, kind of virtual models um, and you also um, the, but, but there are but there are role models also out there they're just kind of under the radar and for example you, the German uh, middle-sized companies, the uh, called uh, the Hidden Champions mm -hmm. or, and the, the Mittelstand, the middle-sized companies which have all the loyalties to place and to the workforce and to the community that you would want family sustained and, and, and um, supported by their uh, bank. So that's one uh, powerful model. Of course, you can't necessarily always reproduce the social conditions that have created them, but uh, but but they're um, an interesting model, and um, which proves it's not impossible for the mm -hmm. traditional company to to continue. There's also the fact that um, if you look around. In almost every industry these mm. days, you can find at least one company that thrives and, you know, over long periods by uh, consistently by doing things differently and largely by um, concentrating on providing goods and services that respond to customer needs rather than pursuing just having a purpose of of uh, of pursuing shareholder value and they're what uh, um, have been termed positive deviance mm. and so you have in uh, in banking there's the swedish handelsbanken which just goes on expanding and expanding uh, not for the sake of it but because people want to bank there. Uh, there's Toyota in uh, cars that, um, you know, whose production system, Toyota production is one of the marvels, uh, another marvel of human ingenuity. And, um, and so, so there's uh, Toyota, which, is, which also you should say that these companies actually in the long term do better to shareholders mm. than exactly. companies which are, which, are, which are fixated on shareholder value. And you could go on. I mean, I think Apple, although there are doubts over, it is paying an awful lot back to shareholders these days. But, but there are companies like mm. that that show that, that it can, it be, can done. be done. Exactly. Do you think there's a role for things like the B corporations and indeed, so on? Indeed, indeed, yes. Good point. Um, there's the B corps. I know you've you've had a, or are going to have a session on that. Mm -hmm. um, um, yes, yes. Again, from a small base, yeah. um, but these are companies which have in their constitution and. Uh, so on a a a social oh, aim happens, or yeah. an aim beyond making money, and they have to live up live up to yeah, that. Yeah. So that's very encouraging mm. too. And indeed, uh, a company like Unilever, mm. or another company that uh, <coughs> actually is a very positive one, and Paul Polman, 
uh, the chairman is one of the few corporate leaders who will stand up for this uh, longer term vision has actually said that if, uh, if, if he could get it past the shareholders he'd quite like Unilever to become one of these companies yeah. of eco, which would Absolutely. be a coup. <laughs> um, one question that's come in for the, from the audience, <clears throat> you've obviously named a lot of kind of large corporates and so on that are some of these leading examples as well as at medium size um, companies uh, in Germany as well. What about the role of small companies um, and local business and so on in leading, perhaps leading the charge um, towards good business, towards being good companies? Well, yeah. that would be nice, but mm. um, in fact, the rate of small company formation um, is rather lower depressingly than it has been in the past and there are many reasons for this but uh, certainly in the UK um, it's partly financial because the banks um, who are also part of the same uh, under the same pressures and <clears throat> the same forces that we've been talking about before simply don't lend to businesses banks just lend to you and me buying houses that's mm -hmm. all they want to do they don't want to do anything as risky as uh, lend to business so um it would uh, it would be nice if that was the case but it's also and, and, and you would want a steady supply of small companies coming through, obviously. Um, and, uh, but we need to rely on more than just yeah. that, I think. Absolutely. That's a very fair point. Um, one last question for me. You, you talked a little bit about <coughs> kind of the, there are these role models out there, but, they, but they're basically flying under the radar. Mm. Um, so I wanted to ask about the role of how management is taught and how these examples are sort of shared. So mm. what's the role of business schools and again professors of management in all of this and in changing the mindset? I think you have to, it's quite complicated, I think you have to make a distinction between business schools and institution and the people who, who actually work in them and teach in them because business schools as an institution I think are failing uh, because like the large consultancies they have found themselves turned into bastions of the conventional and the, the ruling paradigm but this is not to say that many of the uh, people teaching them. Some, some of my best friends are business school mm. professors, but and uh, you know, seriously bright and seri doing um, seriously interesting research, and are deeply conscious of the contradictions of the system. But they're part of a um, of a nexus of vested interest, which has a vested interest in 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 the thing continuing. Mm. I mean, there are very sort of strong exceptions to that um, but um, and let's hope that as the non-viability of what's happening now becomes more and more apparent and there are more and more scandals and collapses and so on that that will change I mean it has to change in mm. the end um, but I'm in the short term I'm not hopeful um, and one, well, final question from the audience. Uh, I also lead the governments and cities work at the foundation, and this question is about the role of the government in some of these changes and um, what, what you think about that. Well, I think, and as as uh, very much a European mm. um, in this, that um, governments have to step up mm. and and play a and play a part and will be forced to eventually um, but uh, again what got one of the things that got a big cheer at the at the Drucker forum was Perez 
uh, saying that it's time for governments to come back strongly, wisely and adequately and to take their responsibility for the overall system. If, if you accept that we work in a, in, a, in a system and an evolving kind of ecology of economics, and economics is more ecology than anything else, then uh, you have to, somebody has to, at, at a higher level of the system, have to take responsibility for the position mm. they are in. And that falls to government, I think, to 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 intervene in 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 a, in a couple of ways, and one is um, as uh, the work of Mariana Matsukata has has shown, and um, she works actually with Perez at a new institute at University College um, on these questions on the, the, the issue of public involvement, but. Um, Actually, government investment in R and D. Matsukato has shown that uh, you know all the technologies, almost all the technologies used by Google, used by Apple in Apple smartphone, um, and some of Facebook as well, actually come out of and indeed the internet itself mm. uh, has come over, come out of government research largely in the states. Um, and uh, the, 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 her point is that the companies that have benefited uh, from this have re repaid none of, uh, sort of owe the government not just a moral debt, but uh, they should at least pay their taxes, uh, uh, short of which we won't have the, the supply of uh, public sector re research, which is then um, which is then turned into, um, which is then turned into wealth, mm -hmm. and it should be wealth for more than just um, one or two. And yeah. the other point that that, that um, the other thing that government has to do, in my view, uh, and that is to formally to place on companies and mm -hmm. on directors um, a charge to be responsible f uh, for not just shareholders but for their other stakeholders mm -hmm. that they have to otherwise they should lose their license to operate wow. <laughs> well on that note um, i've really enjoyed this conversation i think we got a great understanding of um, both the role of companies in today's economy what's where they've lost their way a little bit over the last decades um, thank you again for providing those ex concrete examples of, of good business out there um, definitely encourage you to take a look at the other sessions in the diff that are aligned with this theme of 21st century economics thank you again simon for being in the studio for with us and um, contributing your your opinions to this um, again please do check out thinkdiff.co uh, to find out more information about uh, other sessions that we have on on this theme and we'll see you next time.